Well, let me give you a scenario that probably all of us face at one time or another. And that is you have a dear friend or perhaps a relative and they have been diagnosed with some life-ending disease. They don't have long to live on this earth and you go to visit them. Where do you turn in scripture to comfort them? What, what verses do you read to them? This person is a Christian. Probably a lot of you would say, well, the 23rd Psalm. One of the most comforting portions of scripture. Maybe. Or perhaps you would want to go to Romans 8, where it talks about what can separate us from the love of God. And the answer is nothing. And Paul gives this laundry list of examples. Well, that's a good place. But I would suggest to you that the most comforting portion of Scripture for a Christian in the entire Bible is what Randy just read for us. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Now you may say, think, well, Pastor, that sounds a little odd to me. But bear with me. As we go through Scripture this morning, I think you will be able to see where I'm coming from with that statement. Because... These six verses lay out for us exactly what happens to a Christian at the point of death. And it's all good. It's all good. We need have no fear of death because for us to die is to really live. Life really begins for us at the point of death. Life as God intended it to be at any length. And I think as we work our way through this text, uh, we will make clear that this is indeed a truly comforting portion of Scripture. But now what we're going to do is we're actually going to attempt to answer a totally different question. And that question is, what is the millennium? Now, if you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably heard uh, several messages on it. Maybe you've read a few books on it. Uh, who knows? It surprised me that last week, no one called me on the fact that I totally skipped these six verses. Went right over them and moved on. Now, why would that surprise me? Well, because it's uh, such a contentious subject in some places. And it's, it's a subject that has actually been called by many theologians, the six most difficult verses in the Bible to interpret. If you go to a bookstore, or you don't go to bookstores anymore, if you go online and look, you will find that there are at least hundreds, if not thousands of books that have been written on this subject, the millennium, over the years. And there's several different camps that uh, Christians have divided themselves up into. And uh, there are, are four uh, main ones over the years. Uh, the oldest is, is what, we would, what we call classical premillennialism. Well, pre means before, right? And they're talking about Christ returning before the millennium. Classical premillennialism was uh, taught for a brief period of time in the, the end of the first century, end of the second century. Uh, some of the guys from the morning Bible study will recognize Irenaeus, Athanasius, those guys, they taught, they taught what we call classic premillennialism, which just says time will rock on, Christ will return. There's no rapture or anything in this now, don't get me wrong. Uh, Christ will return, set up the, the millennial kingdom here on earth, and we rock and roll from there. Now out of that uh, comes what, uh, we, what was popularized in, in, in the uh, late 18th century, 19th century, called dispensational premillennialism. Okay? We won't spend a lot of time with that one because I think it's mostly just wishful thinking. And then there are the, there are the other two, which are really, uh, you could call them kiss and cousins or whatever, because they, they share a whole lot and, and differ mostly not in, in timing and that sequence, but in the nature of the millennium. And that is what we call post-millennium. Post would mean after. And all-millennialists. Which is a little confusing. I know you find it hard to believe in theology, that it gets confusing. Because if, if you follow theological terms at all, you know that a term that begins with an A comes from a Greek 
word and the a prefix to a Greek word negates it. So technically all millennial would be no millennium. But that's not what all millennials believe. In fact they're trying to rebrand themselves now a little bit which I think is a good thing and uh, one fellow has, has suggested that they, they, they call it realized eschatology because what all millennials actually believe is as with post millennialists that the millennium started with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and is now in progress. Okay? Now both of those positions I think are solidly biblical positions. And I find myself in good company uh, as I wax and wane between the two by the way. Uh, I, I, I used to always be a little embarrassed people would ask me well are you post-millennial or amillennial? And my answer was usually well it depends on the most recent book I've read. <laughs> Because they both have good, strong biblical arguments. And I was always a little embarrassed about that because I like specificity. I like to know where I'm at. Until at a Bible conference one day, they were question and answer time. R.C. Sproul was up on the, on the stage and somebody asked him, well, just what are you? Are you post-millennial or all-millennial? And Sproul said, much to my delight, he said, well, I'll tell you what I am not. I am solidly not dispensational premillennial because there's no biblical evidence for it. But I am either amillennial or postmillennial. It depends on how I feel that day. <laughs> or, so I felt like, gee, I'm in pretty good company here. So we're, we're going to look at this passage and kind of work through it and, and see where we're at. And, and, you come out wherever you come out, just make sure you come out having gone through the steps of working through the passage biblically. And, and just, just another thing, if you, if you uh, want to come down on the post side or the aw side, uh, you have all kinds of giants of the faith who, who are in company with you. Uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, was a post-millennial guy. Calvin was an all-millennial guy. Two of the most brilliant people that ever lived. So, which one are you going to go with? Yeah. Either one is a good choice. So we're going to try to go, though, with what Scripture says about it and see uh, exactly where we come out. Do you realize, now this millennium thing has been kicked around, this thousand-year reign, right? And by the way, the, way, the word millennium just comes from the Latin word for thousand. Okay? That's all it means is a thousand. The only place in the Bible where this comes up is right here in these few verses. Can't find it anywhere else. It's interesting, isn't it? It's just this little piece of scripture is just so pregnant with possibilities. Remember now, when it talks about a thousand years, if nothing else we've learned about the language of the book of Revelation is that it is symbolic, right? It's symbolic. We, we don't try to take it and force it into a, a literal uh, interpretation or a letteristic interpretation. So a thousand years simply means a long period of time. Okay. We know when it began. It began at the cross. We don't know when it ends. It will end with the return of Jesus. Jesus Christ. So we're somewhere in the middle of that thing. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to ask you to do a very hard thing. I want you to Put aside what you've been told to believe about the millennium. And that's hard to do. I want you to just set that aside for a minute and just work with me through this passage of Scripture and see what God's Word speaks to you. First thing I want us to notice is there are two perspectives here. Verses 1 through 3 is an earthly perspective of what's going on during the millennial kingdom. And verses 4 through 6 our heavenly perspective. Now this is not new to us either in Revelation, is it? We often see this, don't we? We're given a, a scenario from one perspective and then we're given the same scenario from another perspective and sometimes even another perspective after that as if we're not already confused enough. And then we have to sort through all of these things. Both scenarios encompass the same time period. And when is that time period? Three-letter word? Now, 
the millennium is going on right now. I'll show you how that works out as we go along. What John sees in these first three verses is the binding of Satan. Now, now that term has thrown a lot of people off too. Because when they, they think about the binding of Satan, they think of total incapacitation. But that's not what it means. It means he is restricted, not annihilated, not rendered completely impotent, but he is restricted. And that happened at the resurrection. Jesus went up to heaven, Satan was thrown out of heaven, and he was bound. Now bear with me on that, we'll, we'll sort through that a little bit too as we go along. Think about it before the cross. Satan did what? He deceived the nations, right? How many missionaries were there before the cross? How much time did God's people spend trying to spread his word to the Gentiles before the cross? They didn't. And why didn't they? There's no point in it. Satan had completely deceived the nations. The only place you could find anybody worshiping the one true God were the Jews. And they only did it because God chose them and said, here I am. I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people. Okay? But now after the cross, what do we see? Immediately in the book of Acts, we see Jewish Christians going out and they go to the Gentiles, they go to the Samaritans, they go to the Romans, they go to all these people who have before been excluded from the gospel, and now they're all coming in. Because Satan now is restricted and cannot interfere successfully in that process. He can no longer deceive the nations as he once did. He cannot mount an army to destroy the church. Now we've seen that that's his desire, right? He, he couldn't get at Jesus. You remember the scene in, in Revelation chapter 12, the child is about to be born, the dragon is waiting to devour it, and the child is snatched up to heaven. And so the dragon turns his ire on the church. Now if he were able, if he were not restricted, he would destroy the church. He would mount an army and simply wipe us out. And we've seen over the years, you read your history books, that has been tried many times. But never successfully. Oftentimes it looked like it was going to be a success, didn't it? But it never was. Because Satan is restricted. And, and we've talked about, and we will see that it, at the end of the millennial period, God sort of throws those chains off of him. And what does he do? The first thing he does, he rises up, raises an army, comes against the church. Last week, remember? And the battle lasts about a tenth of a second, and God wipes him out. And that's the end of him. But we're not to the end yet. We're in this millennial period. The time will end with Jesus' second coming, when Satan will be released and destroyed. But there is much more to the millennium than just this. What we are going to do now is see just what the Bible says about the millennium. And we're going to answer three questions about it. We already know the, the when. The when is now. I think we pretty well settled that one as we've gone through the book. So the three questions we're going to answer this morning are, where does the millennium take place? The millennial reign. Where does it take place? And remember, the millennial reign is not Christ's physical reign here on earth. Who participates in it? And what is its character? In other words, what, what, is, what, what is it like? What does it look like? So where does the millennial reign take place? Look at verses, verse 4 through 6. Then I saw thrones and seated on the thrones to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded 
for the testimony of Jesus Christ, for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, in that verse, well, let, let me just read on here. Let me, let me read 5 and 6. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. Then this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, our question is, where does the millennial reign take place? Do you see anything in those verses that point to it taking place here on earth? No, you don't. Do you see anything in those verses about a rebuilt Jewish temple? No. Do you see anything in those verses about a reinstitution of the sacrifices? No. Do you see anything in those verses about Jesus coming to earth and setting up his physical kingdom? No. So we can rule out that the millennial reign takes place here on earth. Okay, we're halfway there. We now know where it doesn't take place. Now from these, ver the, these verses we just read, where does it take place? Well, we see in verse 4, what's the first thing John tells us he sees? He sees thrones. Thrones, right? We've seen thrones before, chapter 6. And where are the thrones? They're in heaven. They're in heaven. Forty-seven times in the book of Revelation, John uses this word thrones. Forty-five times they are always in heaven. The two times that they are not is when he's talking about uh, the throne of the beast and the throne of the devil. Those are not in heaven. Every other time, they're in heaven. So it would just be logical that these thrones John sees are in heaven. That's our first clue. Our second clue, it is where the disembodied souls of the martyrs are. Look what he says here. Seated on the throne were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark. So he sees the souls of all these people. Now where are you going to see souls? Especially disembodied souls. You're going to see them in heaven. Okay. So that's clue number two. Remember chapter 6? The martyrs were there. They were under the throne. And they were crying out to God, How long? How long? So he saw the souls who had been slain. These are the souls of Christians who upon death have been immediately transported into heaven. Okay. Not just the martyrs, but all Christians. Let me, say, let, me, let me just show you here, if you read that carefully. It says, those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God, comma, if your Bible has a period there, I would suggest getting another version. Because some do. They put a period there. And what that suggests is that it's only the martyrs that it's talking about, but that just, that's not what should be there. There should be a comma or something similar. So, the seas, those who have been beheaded for the word of God and those, now that's another group, right? And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, had not received the mark on his forehead. And we know from previous study that there will not be any Christians receive the mark of the beast, right? We, we covered that. So, we're good to go here. So, all Christians is who he sees. All that have died up till then, anyway. Clue number three. It takes place where Jesus is. They're there together with Jesus Christ. Where Jesus is. 
Now, how awesome is that? And we, we sang about that. You know, we're going to fly away and we're going to be awestruck by being in his presence. You know, Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's an instantaneous thing. The moment you draw your last breath, you come to life. That's what it amounts to. Where Jesus is. You know, the Apostles' Creed, uh, it, it's just such a good, succinct little uh, creed for what we believe, you know. And it, in there, it, you know, it says that Jesus was begotten of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, was buried, descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, and what? Ascended to the right hand of the Father God Almighty. From thence he will return one day to judge the living and the dead. So the apostles, now they didn't write the Apostles' Creed, by the way. It can get a little confusing. But they knew, and the folks that wrote the Apostles' Creed had it down. Christ, upon his death, now he stayed three days, and ascended to heaven. We, upon our death, have a better deal even than Jesus had. We don't have to wait three days. We instantly go to heaven to be with him. Now that's a good deal. Well, Jesus goes up. You remember chapter 12? Satan's thrown down. Another question, though. Who participates in this millennium? And we've really already answered that question. All those who die as believers in Jesus Christ. Whether you've died a martyr's death, or whether you just simply died of old age, as sometimes I think is imminent for me. You know, you get up in the morning and a creek. And... <laughs> but at any rate, regardless of how we die, the hope of glory is then realized for us. All Christians. Now, what comfort this is to someone who is on their deathbed, or to someone who has just lost someone who was a Christian that they loved dearly. That person is now sitting in glory, ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ. How wonderful is that? That's pretty good. So let's look at the character of the millennium for a minute, the millennial reign. In other words, when we say what will be the character of it, what will be our experience? What will it be like? Well, again, God tells us, first, it will be a time of vindication. And you may say, what do you mean vindication? Well, at the moment of your death, you will be granted God's vindication. At the moment of belief, God gives us eternal life. But Satan judges us unworthy of eternal life, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. That's why you get these thoughts every once in a while that, well, you know, do I really believe this stuff? Uh, well, will I really ought to be with the Lord if I die? Uh, is, really, is this stuff really true? Am I just wasting my time, just spinning my wheels, missing out on some good party times? Because Satan has judged you worthy of death, God has judged you worthy of life. When you die, God's judgment is vindicated. In other words, his is proven true. And you receive that life. Upon our death, God's judgment is vindicated so that we may reign with him. And that, my friends, is relationship. We have relationships now and they bring us great joy, and they bring us great sorrow, and unfortunately sometimes the two are yeah, equal, you know. But when we have that kind of relationship with God, when we're actually in His presence, we're not going to have that trade-off anymore. It's going to be all good, all positive, you know. He'll wipe away our tears. We're going to talk about those things next week 
And we get into the final two chapters of this marvelous book that we're reading. Another thing uh, that uh, our <clears throat> millennial experience uh, will encompass is one word, dignity. You may, again, you may say dignity. Our sanctification will be complete. Our sanctification will be complete. We will be conformed to the image of Christ. You remember we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. But that's a process, isn't it? And that process takes place over our Christian life and it is completed upon our death. You know? Now, some of us get further down the road than others. It's an easier walk for some of us than others. You know? Uh, I, I know I, I have friends and I, and really nice people and I think, gee whiz, if those people would put their faith in Jesus Christ, they wouldn't have to change a single thing in their life. They're just such good folks already. And then there's people like me that was just Oh, jerk. And I had to change a lot of things. And I'm still working on changing things. You know? But it doesn't matter at the point of our death. Because the moment we die, that sanctification is completed. And we receive the dignity that was lost. Where? In the garden. Exactly. You, see? you remember what Adam and Eve's experience was after the, after the, the fall. They, they now felt shame, they now felt humiliation, they now felt guilt, uh, they wanted to hide from God. All of those things, and we all feel those things to one extent or another, and from time to time, that'll all be gone. And we'll realize what God created man and woman to truly be like. Notice how John refers to this. In verse 5, this is the first resurrection. Upon our death, we experience the first resurrection. Now, paradox is a word that we've uh, either willingly or unwillingly become familiar with as we've gone through this book of Revelation. Here is the ultimate paradox. Satan wants you dead. If you die... You go to heaven to be with God forever and ever. Isn't that kind of the ultimate paradox? If he's successful in killing you, he ushers you into eternal life. You know, as I thought about that, and I know you guys have heard me quote this before, but it, it really brought to life Bonhoeffer's words, you remember, as he was going up the steps of the gallows to be hung? And he looked around and he said, For me, this is the end. The beginning of life. And this really brings that out to me, exactly what he was saying. I mean, I knew what he was saying before, but somehow it just really hit home as I studied this passage. For us to die, for this life to end, is the beginning of real life, of true freedom. We regain our dignity. Jesus' death as the sacrificial lamb was necessary. It inaugurated his dignity as the Lion of Judah. You see? And so it is with us. Another word that will characterize the millennial reign is security. Now that's something we all like, is security. Security from what? Security from the second death. Skip with me over to uh, verses 13 through 15. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life... He was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. A death we will never experience. We don't have to worry about it. You look at verse 6. 
Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. No power. But we will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So when is the millennium? The millennium is now. Where is it taking place? Where is it being realized? In heaven. Right now. When will we partake in it? When we die. Okay. Do we need to fear death then? No. We don't. It still probably won't be a wonderful feeling for us. We may not like the process we go through. But the end result will be amazing. It will be to step into the presence of the great living God. Remember, there are two groups of people once again, aren't there? There are believers among whom the second death has no power. And there are unbelievers who will never experience that first resurrection, but only the second death. Both of them last forever. So which camp are you in? Which group are you in? I don't know. And when I ask that question, I'm not asking, where are you on the journey to sanctification? I'm asking, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Has there been a time when you said to him, I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Because that's what separates those who enjoy the first resurrection from those who experience the second death. So I would encourage you, make sure which camp you're in. And then you can begin that road to sanctification. But it always, it's kind of a, at least for me, it's always been a three steps forward, two steps back kind of thing. I have to work on it. So don't be discouraged if you struggle. Don't be discouraged if you have setbacks. Because one day you'll be complete. And that'll be the day you die. The day you really begin to live. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for this encouraging word. For the fact that we know our destiny. We know what's going to happen to us. That we are going to rule and reign with you. Really not just for that thousand years. But forever. And so oh God. We put our faith in you. We believe in you. We struggle while we're here. And we ask that you help us. That you fill us with your Holy Spirit. So that we can do better. So that we can do more. And yet we are not disheartened by the setbacks we continue to move ahead with our eyes fixed upon you as Paul said pressing onward toward the goal which is to one day be united with you forever and ever in Jesus name Amen <laughs>